The advancement of medical science has always been a dangerous proposition. Procedures that were once thought to be impossible, like transplants, have become almost commonplace today. More than one doctor has had a radical idea that was opposed by the establishment only to be proven right later on. And there's perhaps no more dramatic example than that than that of physician Werner Forsmann, who, when faced with all the obstacles of the system, decided to ignore all the rules and perform his experiments anyway on himself. And much to his surprise, his reckless behavior would eventually garner him a Nobel Prize. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Werner Forsmann was born in Berlin, Germany in 1904, the only child of a lawyer who was killed in action in the First World War in 1916. Twelve years old, Forsmann was then attending grammar school in Berlin, and his mother was forced to work as an office clerk to support her family. His education was largely supervised by his grandmother, and his interest in the medical field seems to have been inspired by his uncle, a general practitioner with a nearby office. At his confirmation, the family gifted him a microscope, which he used to study protozoa taken from his aquarium. When he graduated in 1922, Forsman told a teacher that he wanted to be a tradesman, but the teacher argued that that kind of life wasn't for him. Forsman, he alleged to have said, when you become a tradesman, everybody will earn money but you. You must study medicine. That is, your great talent. He entered medical school at the Friedrich Wilhelm University in Berlin, now Humboldt University, where he was a student of a number of prominent doctors and where he first began thinking about a new way to research the heart atraumatically through the vasculature. That is, to reach the heart not by cutting into the body, but by traveling through the body's own highway to the heart, veins, capillaries, and arteries. He took advantage of clinical opportunities at his uncle's practice, which gave him vital experience. His doctoral thesis concerned the effects of liver extract on blood chemistry, and that thesis represented his first foray into self-experimentation, because he took those extracts himself. He graduated from medical school in 1928. Initially, he hoped to work in internal medicine, but his first application to a hospital was rejected. He instead joined the August Victoria Hospital near Berlin, first in the gynecology department before transferring to surgery. In his first year of medical school, he had learned about the work of French physiologists who had been pushing the boundaries of cardiological work. French experiments had successfully measured the intercardiac pressures of the heart by inserting catheters directly into the hearts of horses and other animals. Most important, however, was the work of Claude Bernard. Bernard regularly used the technique of cardiac catheterization and explained many of his experiments in a book published in 1879. Cardiac catheterization is exactly what it sounds like, the insertion of a catheter like the kind used in urology to travel along veins and actually enter the heart. Doctors in the 1920s were limited to a few familiar diagnostic tools when looking at a patient's cardiac condition, including percussion, the use of a stethoscope, the use of x-rays and electrocardiograms. But Forsman hoped to add to that list heart catheterization, which would allow several diagnostic procedures without affecting the blood flow in the heart or requiring general anesthesia. Forsman was convinced that the experiments that the French had done on animals were proof that that procedure could be done safely on humans. At the hospital, he built an important relationship with Richard Schneider, the hospital's chair of surgery. Soon, though he had been working less than a year, he was already discussing with colleagues and Schneider his ideas about heart catheterization. According to an article in the American Journal of Cardiology, Schneider comprehended Forsman's vision, but with the advantage of experience knew that the ideas would face significant criticism from the established academic community. Forsman was, after all, not even an academic, and the medical establishment in general viewed heart catheterization as dangerous and possibly fatal. Forsman wanted to begin testing catheterization on humans, a clear leap over traditional medical experimentation. Instead of banning the experiments outright, Schneider advised that Forsman should do his experiments on animals first to prove their safety, but Forsman, apparently headstrong and confident, had little patience for carrying on preliminary research that he thought was already complete. Instead, he proposed a self-experiment, that he would catheterize his own heart using a retral catheter to prove its safety on humans. Schneider categorically and specifically forbade any such experiment, and Forsman proceeded to ignore that order. In 1929, Forsman, only a resident, chose to go forward with his intention to catheterize his own heart. In his efforts, he had a co-conspirator, the ultimately unwitting nurse Gerda Ditson. Forsman himself did not have access to the tools he would need to perform the procedure, and so he began unburdening his dream to scrub nurse Ditson. Ditson was apparently convinced by Forsman's hypothesis and agreed to help him on the condition that she would be the subject and not himself. 
In the earlier test on animals, the catheter had been inserted via the jugular, but Forsman planned instead to use the cubital vein located in the elbow. The vein is superficial and is the vein of choice for drawing blood and intravenous access in modern medicine. Sometime in the early summer of 1929, he prepared to do the procedure. Ditson wanted to sit in a chair, but Forsman convinced her to lay on a table as he would be needing to apply local anesthesia. However, once she was on the table, he surreptitiously bound her to it and only pretended to do the incision inside her elbow. Instead, unnoticed, he had applied the anesthetic to his own arm. He made the incision on his own arm and then proceeded to introduce the catheter 30 centimeters into the vein. It was only then that Ditson realized that she had been duped. She cried and grumbled her dismay, but Forsman merely asked her to call the x-ray nurse. Now that they were fully committed, he could release her from the table. The pair walked to the floor below, where the x-ray room was located and where a nurse waited, who was not privy to the clandestine operation. In dramatic fashion, one of Forsman's colleagues appeared around this time and attempted to physically pull the catheter from his arm, but Forsman was able to overcome him and proceed with the experiment. In the room was a fluoroscope, a kind of x-ray machine that allows for the viewing of x-ray film without developing photographs. Standing behind the machine, Forsman viewed the progress of the catheter using a mirror held by the nurse and continued to push the catheter through the vein. At around 60 centimeters, he had reached the ventricular cavity and had entered the heart. He wasn't able to go any farther, however, owing to the length of the catheter. Documented on the film, Forsman had successfully, if wildly recklessly, become the first person to successfully catheterize the human heart. The potential uses for the procedure were, of course, yet unexplored. Before anything else could be accomplished, however, he had to face the wrath of Dr. Schneider. Of course, his boss was less than happy with Forsman's methods, but the evidence on the film was without question a significant breakthrough in cardiac medicine. Instead of firing Forsman on the spot, Schneider decided to take advantage of the opportunity. He felt that it would be wise to focus first on the therapeutic applications of the procedure as opposed to the diagnostic ones, and so he ordered Forsman to perform the procedure again, this time on a terminally ill woman. Though Forsman had initially primarily envisioned the use of catheterization to examine the heart, this first practical application was to apply medication directly into the heart's right ventricle, which quickly proved to be more effective than by IV. It didn't save the patient, but post-mortem study proved that the catheter had reached the heart, and this time it had been done without an x-ray, but merely by measuring the distance between the incision and the heart. He was hired in October at a teaching hospital associated with his university called the Charity Hospital under the leadership of Ferdinand Sauerbruck. He had been there less than a month when his report regarding the sounding of the right heart was published on November 5th. Forsman seemed to have believed that this experiment would secure his accolades in his career. However, that was not to be so. The paper immediately caused an uproar in Germany and received considerable attention from the media. Because Forsman had not consulted Sauerbruck, he was immediately dismissed. Sauerbruck is alleged to have said that, With work like this, you will qualify in a circus, but not in a reputable clinic. You certainly can't begin a career in surgery in that manner. For a time, Forsman continued with his own work, where he did other experiments, including at least nine self-catheterizations of the heart. In 1931, he was asked to return to the charity hospital, largely thanks to his 1929 paper, but he was discharged a year later for not meeting the scientific expectations of his chief. His surgical skills, however, were commended, and he got a job in a hospital in Mainz, where he met and married his wife. Partially thanks to his controversial work in cardio, he shifted instead to urology in 1933. Forsman continued to work in urology, but of course this was a unique time in German history, one that would have a profound impact on Forsman's legacy. In 1932, before the Nazis had taken power, Forsman joined the Nazi party. His move was not uncommon. In all, 44.8% of German physicians would become members of the party, in part because they were struggling financially and the Nazi party promised to remedy that. However, Forsman joined early compared to many physicians and was not under the pressure to join that later physicians would face under Nazi rule. He was also part of the Nazi Doctors Association and became a member of the SA in June of 1933. For doctors, work in the SA was generally minimal and required little political engagement. He did refuse to carry out sterilization procedures on the disabled, though he claimed it was because the operations were time-consuming and dull. Of course, his time in the Nazi party was controversial and represented a black mark on his earlier work. In 1933, he worked under an SS officer who introduced him to Karl Gebhardt, who was later executed for unethical experimentation. To Forsman's credit, he refused to participate when Gebhardt offered to provide a constant supply of human research subjects and left the hospital after being criticized for treating Jewish patients. 
He joined the Wehrmacht as a medical officer and saw combat on the Eastern Front. During the war, he was said to have stopped an SS officer from executing POWs, and then a denazification certificate was said to be a thorn in the NS senior officers. Another denazification certificate claimed to observe in Forsman a general disappointment in the Nazi party as the 1930s wore on, and that he was deeply opposed to the violence that followed in Germany. The witness saw Forsman as neither an activist nor a militarist. The French occupation authorities eventually classified him as a follower, which required him to pay a fine of 15% of his monthly salary for three years. A 2016 paper in Urologia Internationalis concluded that he was supportive of the Nazis in the early period, and that sources are not clear as to when his opinions changed, but that he distanced himself from Nazi ideology after the war, as the authorities state an attitude quite typical of a larger segment of German physicians in the period. His daughter would say that his party membership was a source of everlasting shame for him. Towards the end of the war, he deserted and went and turned himself in to the Americans. He spent some time in a POW camp, and his return to his family in the Black Forest included a prohibition from him practicing medicine owing to his party affiliation. He worked for a while as a lumberjack, and he wasn't able to return to medicine until 1950. His pre-war work had fallen through the cracks, but it had been rediscovered by two doctors in America, Andre Cournard, originally from France, and Dixon Richards. They developed cardiac catheterization using Forsman's techniques in a collaboration that developed the field of cardiopulmonary physiology. For this work, the pair, along with Forsman, were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1956. He and his entire family, wife and six kids, traveled to Stockholm for the ceremony, the culmination of work he had done recklessly 27 years prior. After receiving the Nobel Prize, Forsman accepted a much more prestigious position in Dusseldorf, and the hospital where he famously performed his self-experimentation was later named after him. He retired in 1969. In 1974, he released a memoir entitled Experiments on Myself, Memoirs of a Surgeon in Germany. He passed away in 1979, ironically of a heart attack, but his children continued to pursue medical advances. One became a renowned peptide researcher, another developed a device that allows a non-invasive way to destroy kidney stones. His contribution to the study of medicine was significant. Christian Seiler, co-chairman of cardiology at the University Hospital of Bern, Switzerland, said that Forsman's contribution concerns the entire field of research in human medicine and not just cardiology, which cannot be regarded high enough. Seiler also underlined that instead of becoming another Mengele, Forsman actually pioneered one of the most important points made in the 1948 Nuremberg Code on Medical Research. That human medical experimentation which is life-threatening should not be performed unless the lead investigator himself is subjected to the experiment. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.